Come, all who are loved by God. Come and be fed with food that he gives freely. Come and quench your thirst from the waters of life. Come and let your spirit be filled again with the goodness of your Creator. Lord God, giver of all good things, we hear your invitation. We see your gifts of life and grace. We have come, we have tasted, and we know, God, you are good. With these words of welcome, I welcome you into the presence of Almighty God, wherever you are, knowing that we are connected by the Spirit of God, by the image of God that is in each one of us. And I am so grateful that you are here with us again today. And as we worship in this way, may God bless us and keep us in this holy light. Come, let us sing together. We have come into his house. have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Concentrate on Him and worship Him. Let's forget about ourselves and concentrate on Him and worship Christ the Lord. Worship Him, Christ the bring our praise and confession. Let us pray. Lord, life is a mystery far too deep for us to fathom, too large for us to grasp. We are just ordinary people seeking to make each day something special and hoping that in some way our lives might have meaning, might count. And so we recognize that we need so much. We need wisdom, your wisdom and strength. We need your compassion and courage. And we turn to you as the source of what we need. And what a surprise it is to discover that you are within us. In Jesus, you have stepped into our world. By your spirit, you have stepped into our hearts. How often we have missed this hidden treasure inside us. Yet we are just ordinary people, but we are your image. And we are filled with your presence. Forgive us for our blindness and for our neglect of the gift of yourself with which you have so generously blessed us. Father God, who embraces us in mercy and acceptance, we recognize those places in our lives where we have been hurt and rejected and we offer them this morning to you. We recognize those times when we have hurt and rejected others. And we too offer these to you. And we recognize the ways that we have failed to believe in your forgiving power. In the name of the one who died, who said, Father, forgive them. We pray that you would cleanse and heal us and help us to live in the strength that comes from your love. Meet with us in these strange places this morning as we offer again our lives and ourselves to you. In Jesus, your name, we pray. Amen. I call upon 
you, Lord. My spirit longs to touch you, and I feel you calling me, so I draw near. I'm reaching out my hands, I need the kiss of your presence, and I feel you reach for me. God of justice, Savior to all, came to rescue the weak and the poor, chose to serve and not to be served. Jesus, you have called us. Freely we've received now, freely we will give. We must go, live to feed the hungry, stand behind the broken. We must go, step 
stepping forward Keep us from just singing Move us into action We must go To act justly every day Loving mercy in every way Walking humbly before you, God You have shown us what you require Freely we receive now, freely we will give We must go, live to feed the hungry Stand beside the broken We must go Stepping forward Keep us from just singing Move us into action We must go Fill us up, send us out Fill us up, send us out Fill us up, send us out, Lord. Fill us up, send us out. Fill us up and send us out. Fill us up and send us out, Lord. We must go, live to feed the hungry, stand beside the broken. We must go. Stepping forward, keep us from just singing, move us into action, we must go. The first reading is from Hosea chapter 5 verse 15 and then chapter 6 to verse 6. I will abandon my people until they have suffered enough for their sins and come looking for me. Perhaps in their suffering, they will try to find me. The people say, let's return to the Lord. He has hurt us, but he will be sure to heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage our wounds, won't he? In two or three days, he will revive us and he, we will live in his presence. Let us try to know the Lord. He will come to us as surely as the day dawns, as surely as the spring rains that water the earth. But the Lord says, Israel and Judah, what am I going to do with you? Your love for me disappears so quickly as morning mist. It is like dew that vanishes early in the day. That is why I have sent my prophets to you with my message of judgment and destruction. What I want from you is plain and clear. I want your constant love, not your animal sacrifices. I would rather have my people know me than burn offerings to me. The second reading is from Romans chapter 4, from verse 13 to 25. When God promised Abram and his descendants that the world would belong to him, he did so not because Abraham obeyed the law, but because he believed and was accepted as righteous by God. For if what God promises to be given to those who obey the law, then man's faith means nothing, and God's promise is worthless. The law brings down God's anger, but where there is no law, there is no disobeying of the law. And so the promise was based on faith, in order that the promise should be guaranteed as God's free gift to all of Abraham's descendants, not just to those who obey the law, but also to those who believe as Abraham did. For Abraham is the spiritual father of us all. As the scripture says, I have made you father of many nations, so the promise is good in the sight of God, in whom Abraham believed. The God who brings the dead to life, and whose command brings into being what did not exist. Abraham believed and hoped, even when there was no reason for hoping, and so became the father of many nations. Just as the scripture says, 
your descendants will be as many as the stars. He was then almost 100 years old, but his faith did not weaken when he thought of his body, which was already practically dead, or of the fact that Sarah could not have children. His faith did not leave him, and he did not doubt God's promise. His faith filled him with power, and he gave praise to God. He was absolutely sure that God would be able to do what he had promised. That is why Abraham, through faith, was accepted as righteous by God. The words, he was accepted as righteous, were not written for him alone. They were written also for us, who are to be accepted as righteous, who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from death. Because of our sins, he was handed over to die, and he was raised to life in order to put us right with God. This is the word of the Lord. An army of ordinary people, a kingdom where love is. Time has now come when the children of promise shall flow together. shall be fulfilled come let us stand strong together abandon ourselves to the king his love shall be ours forever this victory song we shall sing a new day is dawning Come when the children of promise shall flow together as one, a truth long neglected. But the time has now come when the children of promise shall flow together as one. A new day is dawning, a new age to come, when the children of promise shall flow together as one, a truth long neglected, but the time has now come, when the children shall flow together as one. Our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew's gospel, chapter 9, verses 9 to 13, and then 18 to 26. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, 
Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to him, If only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. This is truly the gospel of our risen Lord. Praise be to you, Jesus Christ, our Messiah. Come, let us pray. Father, open my mouth and fill it with your words. Open our ears and fill them with that which you would have us hear this morning. We, we, we rely on you, Father God, that your spirit would fill us exactly where we are and that we would have your shalom at this time. In Jesus' name, Amen. And as he reclined at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with such people, tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call the righteous, not to call the righteous, but sinners. Once upon a time, a minister was traveling through a remote part of the country when he came across a flock of sheep that were, were, were crossing the road. And so he stopped his car and he began to wait and soon the shepherd of the flock came by on horseback. And being a preacher, the man simply couldn't resist approaching the shepherd. You know, he said, you're the first real life shepherd I've ever met. Do you mind me asking you what you think of when you hear the expression, the Lamb of God and the Good Shepherd? The answer was more than he could have ever expected. The old shepherd said, you know, sometimes a springtime is a, a, a tough time for sheep, for sheep, sorry, and for the shepherd. It's lambing time. And it's often a time of great tragedy. When many ewes are giving birth, the shepherd often must deal with problems. Sometimes a lamb will die at birth. Sometimes a ewe dies giving birth. And here is the scene. Over there is a mother sheep that has lost her baby. And over there is a lamb that has lost its mother. But sheep are difficult animals. A sheep will not take a lamb that is not its own. And so we have the frustration and situation of a mother full of the milk that will not nourish her baby because she has no baby to feed. And we have a lamb on the other side, hungry for life-giving nourishment and no mother to feed it. In short order, the motherless baby will starve to death. And it is a scene of abundance and scarcity all at once. And this is what the Good Shepherd needs to do. Now, this is going to be a, great, a bit graphic, preacher, but it's the truth. To reconcile this moment of tragedy, the shepherd takes the lamb that has died and slits its throat. Then he washes the motherless lamb in the blood of the lamb that has died. Only then will the mother accept and feed the motherless lamb as her own. 
<clears throat> that is what I know about the Lamb of God and the Good Shepherd, said the shepherd. Of course, sheep are not the only creatures who can be difficult. And I think I want to suggest that this is the point of this week's Gospel and Old Testament reading. According to the, the, the author of the first Gospel of the New Testament, one day Jesus saw a man sitting at a desk and told him to get up and start following him. And the man got up and start, started following him right there and then. The man wasn't just nobody. His name was Matthew or Levi, if you happen to believe Luke. And he was sitting in the local tax booth because he was the local tax collector in that area. It wasn't a salaried position. It was a contract Matthew was carrying out on behalf of the accompanying Legion of Rome. He was there on behalf of Israel's enemies acting with the authority to tax his own people for, for, for virtually everything they used or laid their hands on. As much as people liked him, like Matthew bled people for all he could get, not all of what he gathered went back to Rome. He had discretionary power to, you, to, to line his own pockets, which meant it was a system ripe for corruption. Not surprisingly, Rome always hired the most ruthless cutthroats that it could find. Not surprisingly too, people like Matthew were despised more than most. They were not allowed in the synagogue for they were regarded as crooks and traitors that they truly were. This was the man who got up that day and followed Jesus on Jesus' command. And Neither Matthew nor Luke tell us why he did it, what encouraged him to get up and follow. Maybe the tone in Jesus' voice, maybe destiny. Putting down his pen, he didn't even finish the form that he was working on. He pushed back his chair, got up and just started heading out the door without once looking back over his shoulders. Just like a lot of the decisions we make that end up changing our lives for good or bad one way or the other. He got up and left everything in the past behind him. Everything that had given his life meaning up to now, he gave up and started following this itinerant rabbi from Nazareth who had suddenly just walked into his life and said that he wanted him. To be with him. We preach sermons, tell children stories, sing hymns about it. Unless I badly miss, my guess more to emphasize the beauty of the moment, the nostalgia of it, the sentimentality, softly and gently, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Patiently, Jesus, Jesus is waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. And we stop right there because it's easier to see that moment through rose-colored glasses than it is to see the way both Matthew and Luke want us to see it. Because what happens next is what puts this dynamic, uh, this dynamic moment into its perspective. It is the point of the whole episode. Jesus didn't just call Matthew because he felt sorry for him. He called Matthew because he really, really liked him and he really liked the crowd that Matthew hung around with. For what Matthew says next is that Jesus is sitting, which in those days means reclining at dinner in a house where there were many, many other tax collectors. Here's Jesus hanging out with the bad bunch. Luke sharpens the point. By telling us that it was not just any house. He tells us that this house that Jesus was eating dinner in was Matthew's house. And Jesus just didn't happen to be there. He was the honored guest invited for Matthew, his newfound disciple and former extortioner, had thrown a great banquet 
for Jesus to celebrate what was happening in his life. He was the man as far as this bad bunch is concerned. And this is what sticks in the throats of those Pharisees this day. Not merely that Jesus was uh, 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 associating himself with toll collectors and sinners, but that he was enjoying his time with them. With, uh, with Matthew, the despised tax collector, and all the other sinners, known sinners, in those parts. In other words, people whose lifestyle and reputation, those who didn't attend synagogue, disapproved of and had excluded from, had been excluded from respectable company. Well, Jesus simply had bad taste, or worse, no taste at all, far as his religious contemporaries were concerned. He hung around with the wrong crowd of people, and it was too bad that his parents hadn't raised him well. But notice where the criticism is directed. It is not against Jesus. It is against the disciples. A code word in most of the Gospels for the church. What both Matthew and Luke were concerned about were the attacks made against the early church for its inclusive table fellowship where all were treated equally. All lives mattered. The church was a place where full acceptance of the other was practiced because Jesus had practiced the same in his own life and his own uh, ministry. And both caused problems, both created hostility, for there were some people who would simply not accept some people as their own. Talk about loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus responded to this criticism, both in his own ministry and no doubt in the life of the early church. And it's a striking in its uh, clarity and inescapable in its demand. Jesus refers to his critics, to a passage at the very heart of their tradition. Go and learn, he says, what this text is about. I desire steadfast mercy, not sacrifice. You'll find that in Hosea 6.6. 6. This passage from Hosea was a favorite verse for Israel, particularly during their time of exile in Babylon. For it was a reminder, it was a reminder to them of that steadfast love and loyalty of God. Jesus was merely practicing that which his own people preached. He lets the fact that his critics did not embody the generous love of God to members of their own community became a form of self indictment There are no outsiders and no insiders in the domain that God has. Everyone is included because it is the very nature of God's love to do so. No one is forgotten. No one is outside the fold. And if you are, he goes and searches for you. I'm not sure what it is that makes people like you and me remarkable like that you that has lost its own lamb in my opening story. I simply know that it happens. In our deep hurt, grief, loss, and maybe just plain fear of really being all that we can be for each other. We begin to grow blind, pure and simple. Blind to the reality of human need around us. Blind to those who need us as much as we have ever needed those whom we have loved and lost. Blind to the fact that the person over there with his or her problem is not really separated from us at all, as if we can go on with our own little lives, as if other lives did not matter. Nothing to become concerned about, not enough to do anything about. And so we go on withholding all that we have in 
us to give and that others need from us. As much as rain was meant to fall from the clouds that can barely contain it, and as much as the parched earth below would be grateful for a single drop, we stubbornly refuse to open our eyes to the reality of it, even when it's standing in front of us, bleating its heart out. And what does it take to get us to open our eyes and recognize the ones who need our help? More than likely one who is prepared to risk our scorn and whatever else we choose to punish, to punish them with for reminding us of something at the very heart of things, something that we seem bent on forgetting. That unless we live for and in and through each other, we cannot really live humanly at all. That love means simply keeping bad company because it is the only way we get to see and enjoy those who are in truth, if not to our liking, our very own. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbour as you love yourself. But who is my neighbour? Who is your neighbour? Who is the one that you will rush to help? Who is the one that you will avoid like the plague? Let us pray. Faithful God, full of compassion, you have promised to be near us and to listen to our prayers for ourselves and others. And so we pray for our world torn apart by hatred and division, broken by poverty and disease. Let your mercy fill our world. We pray for our country, still frightened by the memory of chains, struggling to become new. Let your mercy fill our country. We pray for our families and, com and communities places of celebration and suffering, places of joy and grief. Let your mercy fill our families and our communities. And we pray for ourselves with so much need and so much pain, but with so much hope and so many dreams. Let your mercy fill us again, O oh God. Amen. What a joy it is to be able to share in these services with you. And I'm aware that people all over the world are watching us and celebrating the life of Jesus Christ with us. So thank you for being with us today. I don't have any notices, I don't have any birthdays, I don't have wedding anniversaries, but you know that you've had them. And in our hearts we celebrate these things with you. May the joy of Christ be in you as you celebrate your birthday and a wedding anniversary and may God bless you and keep you. Can I also ask you to remember to pray for those who are on our prayer list, those who need prayers so badly. Please would you do that for me. Good morning everyone. Um, so we are embarking on a new option for us to be able to give our offerings. Uh, you have received the letter uh, from uh, Rod and from John, and we do continue to thank you for your generosity. Um, I'm really showing this video as a technical part of the service, so I do apologize for the break in the worship service. Um, but just to explain to you that what's going to be happening in the future, uh, we are going to be um, using a, an an online uh, payment option called Zapper, which is an app that you will download on your smartphone, whether it is an iPhone or an Android. Um, I am going to post separate tu tutorials, which I hope will be helpful for you if you don't know how to use Zapper. But it is a pretty simple app that you just download onto your phone, load your credit card details in or your debit card details into that um, app. It's extremely secure. 
I've personally used it for at least five years um, and I've never ever had a problem with it and it makes things um, very very simple so what will happen is um, as I show you right now over here is going to be the the QR code which is um, like a barcode you would open up your Zappa app on your phone and literally point it to the QR code which is right over here and it will then give you the option to choose how much you want to pay you press pay and hey presto uh, the money has uh, been paid so we continue to thank you as I said before for your generosity um, we have been able to do so much um, as a congregation as a community not only for uh, the running of our church, but for the greater mission uh, in the spreading of the gospel. Bless you. And thank you also to those who have been giving during this time of lockdown and supporting us, your church, as we continue to be the church wherever we are. We are the church, not the building. You and I are the body of Christ. And I want to just pray for you, for your generosity this morning. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, that your love is amazing, that your generosity touches us even in these times of trial, that your people who love you so much um, and are so aware of what is going on in our world continue to give and give and give. And all I can ask, Lord, is that you would bless their lives and that you would keep on filling them with your spirit and that they would know your peace and your joy. In the name of Christ, I pray this. Amen. Let us join in the final hymn, our final hymn for today. May we be a shining light to the nations. May we be a shining light to the nations, a shining light to the peoples of the earth. Till the whole world sees the glory of your name. May your pure light shine through us. May we bring a word of hope to the nation, a word of life to the peoples of the earth. Till the whole world knows their salvation through your name. May your mercy flow through us. May we be a healing balm to the nations, a healing balm to the peoples of the earth, till the whole world knows the power of your name. May fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Shalom to you now, shalom my friends, may God's full mercy bless you my friends, in all your living and through 
beyond the 